Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so glad to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning, our second service. We're going to make some proclamations this morning. I guarantee you, our God is bigger than anything that could possibly come against us. So we're going to rejoice in that fact this morning and love him. Let's sing. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none. the darkness into the darkness to shine out of the ashes we rise there's no Good morning, church. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the blessing for us to be here and gather as the church. Father, I pray that we may never take this for granted. Lord, we pray right now for Brother Doug, that you will bless him with your anointing, that he will um, deliver a message um, from you, from your word. God, that you will just give him clarity of thought, peace of mind. Father, I also pray for Derek and the uh, praise, praise team and band as they continue to lead us in worship. 
We praise you that we are able to come before you and praise and honor you. I, I pray that we will find favor in your sight this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. What difference has Jesus made in your life? Um, well, I'd say the biggest difference is Christ has had in my life is that I have a hope that no matter what happens in the world, no matter what changes, He is always a solid rock, never changes. One thing that really comes to mind is when I really spend time with God, I would live and act better, and life would just be better. But on the flip side, when I tend to fall, fall away and not really spend as much time with God, life just wouldn't go as smoothly and I would tend to act worse. But another great thing about God, even though I fell away at times, He kept calling me back. And now I can see and look back over the years, He has created me and still led me through those times to what He wants me to be. And following God, it's just better because you have confidence and no, with, no matter what comes your way. and. Like, I don't exactly know what I want to do with my life, but I can just simplify it down and say, you know what? If I keep my eyes on Jesus, if I serve Him and love Him, I'm going to end up where He wants me to be and fulfill my purpose in life. He gives up my life meaning and purpose. Love this. Love telling Jesus that I love Him because He first loved me. Three. 
conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Good morning, church. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. I know a lot of people are anxious and apprehensive about getting out and coming to church, and we certainly understand that. But thank you for putting forth special effort to be here today, and we certainly respect the decisions of those who have underlying health conditions that prevent them from coming. And, but I don't know about you, but I just long for the day that we can all be together and worship the Lord once again. So let's make that a matter of prayer. This time I'd like to direct your attention to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. If you're a regular worshiper with us, you know that I've been preaching a series of expository sermons from this biblical book. I've entitled it, God's Goldmine, Encouragement for the Elect. And today we come to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Please give careful attention to the reading of God's holy word. Peter writes, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. One day we'll be free, free. 
I want to begin today's message by sharing the opening remarks of a sermon that was later transcribed for an article that appeared in the publication, Southern Baptist Convention, Life. It begins, and I quote, Our nation is in crisis, and as a minister of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, I feel I must address this matter. We cannot, we dare not, we must not, and we shall not ignore what is happening in America today. Some terrible and shocking accusations have been made against the President of our beloved Republic, and it is our duty as Americans and as Christians to pray that truth will be revealed and justice administered. In this article, I want to address not so much the crisis at the highest levels of our government, but the bigger and even more disturbing crisis at the level of everyday American life where most of us live. Let me explain what I mean. Whenever charges are brought against one in high office, as we are witnessing in our nation in these days, there are three basic categories of response on the part of the people. The first category comprises those people who are absolutely and totally convinced that the charges are true and that the president is guilty even before all the facts are in. 
All of us have an opinion on the charges, but every man in America is due his day in court. The Bible says, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. A second category is made up of people who are absolutely and totally convinced that the charges are not true and that the president is not guilty, even before all the facts are in. These are the people who believe that the charges in question are fabrications, nothing more than a horrible, partisan political conspiracy to smear the accused. When the person under charges declares his innocence, this second group is ready to believe him. Then there's a third response to serious moral and ethical charges against a person in high office. This is the group I want to talk about because it is here that America's shocking, degrading moral crisis rears its ugly head. This third group of people are those who say, instead of saying the accused is guilty or innocent, say, so what? Who cares? Guilty or innocent? What difference does it make so long as he is doing a good job? These people argue that there is no connection between a man's personal life and his political abilities. And according to all indications, this response to scandal and serious charges is the most common response among Americans, end quote. Although the contents of this sermon seem to describe conditions that currently exist in our country, this message was actually delivered by Dr. Adrian Rogers in November of 1998 when Bill Clinton was president. The title of Dr. Rogers' message was, Does Character Count? Make no mistake about it, this is an important question. Does character count? What value do most citizens of our country currently place on character? Does character count? Do morals matter? Is integrity important? As we sit in this sanctuary on Sunday morning, it is easy to say, yes, Character counts, morals matter, and integrity is important. But how does this play out in real life? How many of you have heard the expressions, well, whatever she does after work is her business? He may cut corners and tell a few white lies, but he is the best salesman this company has. As long as he puts us in a position we win championships, I can overlook a few indiscretions. If it were any other player, I would immediately kick him off the team. But we can't win without him. I know she really doesn't deserve to start, but her father is one of our school's biggest boosters. Sometimes you just have to go along to get along. It can't be that bad. After all, everyone is doing it. So let's look at this subject again. How do things really play out in the real world? world. Does character count? Do morals matter? Is integrity important? And let's take this a step further. Do we hold ourselves to the same standards we expect others to meet? Isn't it true that most of us readily point an accusing finger at the president, a preacher, a principal, a teacher, a coach, a congressman, or some other prominent person when they engage in behavior that compromises their character. But what about us? What about you? What about your family? Are you a little more lenient when it comes to your own faults, the faults of your family, or the faults of your friends? While there is certainly no shortage of opinion on this subject, I trust that we all can agree that what really matters is what the Word of God says about this issue. Although he does not use the term character in today's text, this is in essence what Peter is describing in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. It is important for us to remember that anytime we read a biblical text, we are not being exposed merely to a, a man's opinion. Instead, what we are reading is the inspired Word of God. And while it may be interesting to know what other people think about issues, what really matters is what does God say about this subject. And the central truth of today's text is that in the eyes of God, character does count. Well, there are three key words I want to call to your attention in reference to today's text. The first word I want to mention is the word address. Address. In verse 11, Peter used three forms of address 
as he spoke to those first century Christians who'd been scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We read in the New International Version of the Bible that Peter began by addressing his readers not merely as friends, but dear friends. The Greek term is best translated beloved. And there are a couple of concepts that Peter was seeking to communicate through the use of this term. One of those is that Peter was saying to his readers, you are the beneficiaries of God's love. Simply stated, God loves you. Now, it's important for all of us to understand this theological truth, but I think it perhaps it was even more imperative for those first century Christians. They did not have the benefit of the entire copy of the sacred scriptures. They were familiar with how God operated during the days of the Old Testament. And while the character of God never changes, they had in their minds that God was a God of vengeance, a God of judgment, that he was a strict judge who would not hesitate to give harsh sentences to those who transgressed or broke his laws. And so Peter was encouraging them, in the midst of everything you're going through, you need to remember that God loves you. And then there's a second concept that Peter was communicating through his term, and that is God wants you to love him back. God loves you and he wants you to love him in return. In fact, it's important for us to understand that of all the things that God might want from us, the number one thing is that God wants us to love him. I know this is true because this is what Jesus said. You may recall he was engaged in a conversation in Matthew chapter 22 with an attorney. The attorney was trying to put Jesus on the spot, maybe trying to embarrass him. And he asked the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In other words, love the Lord with every fiber of your being. So after addressing his readers as dear friends or beloved, Peter went on this same verse to address them as aliens and strangers. Let's take a moment to look at the meaning of these terms. The word Peter used for alien refers to a person who is living in a country that is not his native land. In other words, you may be here for a brief length of time, but this is not your home. And he was saying to those Christians, right now you're living in a world surrounded by people who are lost, but your lifestyle should be distinctively different so that when people look at you, they'll recognize that something is different, that you have the presence of the Lord in your life. And so you need to remember, believers, that you're not from here and you're not going to stay here because ultimately heaven is your home. You are an alien. But not only are you an alien, but you're also a stranger. And the term Peter used for stranger was used in reference to a traveler who is passing through a geographical region on his way home. It seems to me that the Lord wants believers of every generation to understand that we must exercise caution that we do not allow ourselves to get too caught up in the things of this world. The reason this is, earth is not our permanent home. Now, this concept is expressed in multiple biblical texts. Paul contrasts the difference that believers and non-believers should have to the things of this world through these words he recorded in Philippians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. He said, Their destiny, that is the destiny of those who are lost, is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. That's why he would later go on to record these words in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. The forms of address that Peter used in reference to these early Christians also apply to our lives. We are dear friends and beloved by God. God loves us and he wants us to love him in return. And one of the ways that we express our love for the Lord, one of the ways you can measure the depth of your love for the Lord is by the level of your obedience to the proclamations found in his word. Again, I know this is true because of these words that came from the lips of our Lord that are recorded in John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. There's a conditional clause, if you love me. In other words, not everybody who says, 
we love the Lord really loves the Lord. The proof is in the pudding. And the proof is, are we living our lives in obedience to God's word? If you love me, you will obey what I command. We are also aliens and strangers here on earth. Therefore, we should be very careful that we do not allow our lives to be too caught up in the things of this world. I think this continues to be one of the biggest temptations facing the church today. How many times have we allowed ourselves to be distracted by all the things this world has to offer and God becomes secondary rather than primary? The devil sometimes operates like a spider. He weaves a web in which he tries to trap us. And that web is comprised of worldly pursuits, possessions, and pleasures. Jesus cautioned us about this when he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's important for us to remember that we are beloved, that we are aliens, and we are strangers. And remembering those things will help us to not engage in behavior that might compromise our character. Why is this important? Because in the eyes of God, character counts Morals matter, and integrity is important. Now, the second word I want to emphasize from today's text comes directly from verse 11. That word is abstain. After addressing his readers as beloved, aliens, and strangers, Peter goes on in verse 11 to write, abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. It is significant to note that the word abstain is an imperative. In essence, Peter is commanding Christians, don't Give in to any type of desire that might cause you to compromise your character and therefore be detrimental to your spiritual well-being. Peter recognized from personal experience that there is a war raging inside of every single believer. That war is between the spirit and the flesh. And Peter was not the only biblical writer who recognized the reality of this war. Listen to what the Lord led Paul to record about this spiritual struggle in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. Peter and Paul said there's a real war taking place, and this war puts your spiritual well-being in grave danger. We face the reality of this war every day of our lives. If you just think about it and be aware that every day Satan will try to trick you, he will try to tempt you, he will try to trip you, and he will try to trap you. And it is imperative that we exercise caution that we do not become casualties in this spiritual warfare. Most of you are familiar with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The memorial that has a wall containing the names of more than 58,000 American soldiers who sacrificed their lives in war so that we might be free. The war in Vietnam may have been a controversial war, but these men died honorable deaths. How tragic it would be if we engage in behavior that would bring dishonor to our names and more importantly, to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every day as we face spiritual warfare as we sense within us a struggle between the spirit and the flesh that we be careful that we make the right decisions that we make the right choices the word of God gives us some insight about the strategy required to win this war Paul gives us his strategy when he says in Galatians 5 16 so I say live by the spirit In other words, don't rely upon your own strength. Don't rely upon your own knowledge 
or the wisdom you've acquired during the course of your life. You be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. There is victory in and through Jesus. Well, why is this such an important issue? It is important because in the eyes of God, character counts, morals matter, and integrity is important. Now, the third third word I want to stress in reference to today's text is advertisement. Advertisement. The reason why we need to abstain from sinful desires is that the lifestyle we live serves as an advertisement for the Christian faith. Notice how verse 12 expresses this concept. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. As I read those words, prayed and pondered over this passage, it was like the Lord was reminding me that his word fits together like pieces in a beautiful puzzle. One scripture just leads to another. And the same theological truths are stressed repeatedly. For example, in verse 9 of his text, we're reminded that God's called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. And we're to live our lives in such a way that people may see our good deeds and glorify God. So, so are there other pieces that fit in the same puzzle? Well, think about the words Jesus said, recorded in Matthew. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bowl, but they put it on a candlestick. So it gives light to everyone who is in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus was saying, live your life in such a way that you're a good advertisement for the Christian faith. Not to call attention to yourself, but so that people can see that there's something different about your life, something they don't have, but there's something they need. And it's manifest in your life. You are an advertisement for the Christian faith. I'm not a big fan of commercials. In fact, if I TiVo a show, I'll just kind of run through those commercials so I can move on to the main action. But I do have great respect for some of the people who write and produce commercials. I've watched commercials on television where there's a, a sizzling steak, and I can literally smell that steak on the grill. Or maybe it's a hot day, a scorching day, and they pull a cold beverage out of an ice chest, and you see the condensation on the, on the glass, and they take a drink, and you say, man, that looks so refreshing. Or maybe there, there's a commercial about a new pair of tennis shoes, and that prominent athlete is wearing those shoes, and if you're a teenager, you probably want to say to mom and dad, man, I need some of those new shoes. If I just had those shoes, I could run faster, I could jump higher, and I could play better if I just had those shoes. Well, you and I are advertisements for the Christian faith. And we should live in such a way that people say, there's something in his life or her life that I need. So what type of advertisement are you projecting for the Christian faith. What about your life? Does character count? What is character? I like this definition. Character is who you are when you think no one is looking. Take a look at your life. Does character count? Do morals matter? Is integrity really important to you? These issues matter to God, and they should matter to us. Because God loves us, He forgives us of all those moments in our past when we have engaged in behavior that has compromised 
our character. And God says, I still love you. I forgive you. It's time to get back up. It's time for you to determine that character counts, that morals matter, and integrity is important. Due to the COVID, we can't currently have a traditional hymn of invitation. This morning, I want you to take just a few moments to ask God to show you how today's text and message applies to your life. What has God been saying to you this morning? What is God saying to you right now? I pray that we might be responsive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. So you take a moment of personal reflection before Matt comes to conclude our service. Thank you, Brother Doug, for that wonderful message this morning. Maybe you're at home today and you're thinking, I need to place my faith and trust in the Lord. Maybe there's something going on in your life right now. Maybe you're struggling with drugs, alcohol. Maybe you're feeling anxious and depressed. Maybe you don't know what's going on with all this quarantine and social distancing. Maybe you're just struggling individually with purpose in this life. Let me tell you something today, that Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. By simply placing your faith and trust in the Lord, you will receive help and hope from our good and loving God. How can you receive eternal life? How can you know that you have peace with the Father? Well, it's simply by doing this. You need to admit that you are a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean that some have sinned or very few have sinned, but everyone has sinned, including you and me. We need to acknowledge this and repent. The word repent just simply means to, to turn in a 180 degree direction and go away from sin and go toward God. So acknowledge that you're a sinner. Repent. And then believe. Believe in the Lord. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So all you have to do is believe. What does it mean to believe? It just means to, to place a confident hope that the Lord exists and that God exists and that He loves you and cares for you. And then simply commit your life to Him. Commit your life to Him by reading your Bible. Where do you start? The Gospel of John is a great place to start. Uh, by praying with others, by learning to pray, by simply asking others, hey, how can I pray? You can um, uh, call the church for assistance. Call our church. 601-442-1464 if you need help growing in your relationship with the Lord. 
you can check us out on the web, www.fbcnatches.org, and click on the connection tab in the welcome. Uh, I mean, click on the welcome tab, and then click the connection card. You can do all of these things and grow in your relationship with the Lord. And if you've made that decision this morning, I encourage you, please let us know. We want to rejoice with you. We want to rejoice knowing that, that there is a child of God that was born today. You can do that by calling the church office at 601-442-1464 or, or simply go into our website at www.fbcnatches.org. Click on the welcome tab and fill out the connection card. Thank you for joining us for worship today.